From meeting and working with three presidents as mayor, to cliffhangers about floods, famous people, near disasters, and encounters with a ton of interesting characters, this is Tales from the Gym City with former mayor Chuck Schultz. Join us for this reoccurring bonus segment. I'm History of Go-Go's host, Rob Mellon. Welcome back, Chuck, and today we're going to discuss famous people that had actually passed through the Gym City that you had the pleasure of meeting over the years. And in that group, there are Supreme Court justices, famous people, baseball players. But let us start with someone who didn't really pass through. He was born here, lived here as a child, went away, and then became famous for an event that changed the entire world. He piloted the Enola Gay, dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, and that was Quincy and Paul Tibbetts. Quite a guy. I think if I made a list of the most uh, interesting and impressive people I've ever met in my life, he would be right up there at the top, Rob. Back in anticipation of the millennium celebration that we would have, like most communities have, that time I was there, we formed a commission. And I asked the commission when planning these celebrations, to see if they could pick the person from Quincy who has had the most impact on world history. And clearly, that's Paul Tibbs. Clearly, no one would ever be able to come close to that. So we invited him to come back home. And he gladly accepted. And it was a wonderful three days. Uh, he, first of all, he wanted to go to the Illinois Veterans Home. And, you know, Rob, when you talk about Paul Tibbetts, and this guy, to me, epitomized duty, honor, country. I was raised by a father who was in the Navy in 1945, being trained and was headed towards the invasion, the land invasion of Japan. And he often told me I would not be here today if it wasn't for President Harry Truman and General Paul Tibbs. And I think that's true. And I know it's controversial, but uh, historians have estimated that it would have been a loss of a million lives on both sides if we had to invade Japan. And it brought an end to World War II. And I could tell from General Tibbs that he never looked back. Even though wherever he went, he was somewhat guarded. This visit to Quincy, he was accompanied by uh, an aide from his publisher, and he brought his book with him. That was, you know, we welcomed that. That was part of the deal. And this fellow, Jerry, he pulled me aside and he said, Everywhere I go with General Tibb, you know, he's always extra cautious. He's on guard because there are people that try to disrupt him. They come up, they insult him or whatever, and he has these confrontations. But he said, In Quincy, For three days now, I've never seen him this relaxed in doing this sort of thing because everyone in Quincy understood that uh, what he did was duty, honor, country. And he's quite an interesting person. Uh, Of course, uh, he was, as you said, born in Quincy, uh, moved away as a child, but came back frequently. He went to school at the Alton Military Academy. His mom and dad actually lived in Miami, Florida. So say a Thanksgiving break would come up, he'd come to Quincy. He'd stay with the Warfields on Main Street. And in fact, when he was here, one of the things that he wanted to do was to go into that house. And at that time, Dr. Eversman, uh, since passed away, great local doctor, he uh, lived in that house. He'd raised all his kids there. And uh, he was happy to host Paul Tevitz, who had the typical reaction that most of us have when we go back to a childhood home that everything seems smaller, but it's a beautiful house uh, on Main Street between uh, 20th and 22nd. So he had a lot of ties here, absolutely. And then, of course, he distinguished himself in World War II in the European theater. He was really, he was the top pilot of the Army Air Corps. He flew Eisenhower. He flew Montgomery. He was their guy. So that led to him being chosen for the Manhattan Project, And it wasn't just his flying skills, which were going to be really important because, you know, once they dropped that order, 
they had no idea what the effect would be on that plane. There's no way to practice that. Uh, of course, he got it through it, got it back within minutes of what the uh, plan was uh, on the original timing. But in addition to being a great pilot, he was in charge of delivering the weapon. So in that regard, he oversaw the production of the plane, which had to be specially done lightweight. He chose every member of the crew. One of my prized possessions, Rob, is at the end of the three-day visit, he gave me his book on the, it's called, it's titled The Enola Gay. Of course, named after his mother, Nate Quentin. And he signed it, and it already had been signed by the rest of the crew. So I have the Enola Gay book signed by all the members of the crew. Of course, all of them are now deceased. But he, it was a thoughtful gesture that I'll, I'll never forget. And seeing him at the veterans' home, it occurred to me, a lot of these guys would probably be like my dad, wouldn't be here today if it weren't for Paul Sevens. So the highlight really was uh, at Clad Arms Park. We had the Quincy Park band there and had a big concert, and uh, I presented him with the key to the city. And before that, Rob, uh, any of your listeners that have attended Quincy Park Band concerts on Memorial Day will know that they do a, a medley of uh, the service hymns, and then members of each service will stand up. So when they start with, you know, the case signs going all along, and all you Army guys stand up and anchors away in the Navy, and of course they got to off you go in the wild blue yonder, and the general stood up. And I'm getting a little emotional thinking about it because this guy was tough, obviously, hard to he, he cussed like a sailor. Uh, I could tell that, you know, he's one of these guys, I don't get ulcers, I give ulcers, you know, he's a general. <laughs> but he became emotional. And uh, he he stood up with the rest of the uh, Air Force and Air Corps. That's down there at the riverfront. And then he uh, came up on the stage uh, with me and I presented him with the key to the city and the response from the crowd, it's an older crowd, they all went through it with him, and they got up out of their lawn chairs, and it was just such a heartfelt ovation. The applause just kept coming, and he peered up. As we walked back down the stairs, he turned to me and he said, that's the goddamnest thing I've ever done. And uh, <laughs> he just, uh, it, it really meant something to him. So I have to close by telling you a, a, an additional story that happened that same day at the riverfront. I mentioned he had written this book, The Anoli Gay, and he had a fellow there from the publishing house, and people wanted to buy it, and we had arranged for a table, and he would sign it, you know, if you buy it. But he had said beforehand, I've done these before, and I think there's people that want to talk to me, but they maybe don't have the money to buy a $30 book. And I don't want them to feel like you've got to buy a book to come through the line and we can meet. And so Jerry's like, okay, okay. Well, there was a, two people, man and wife, kind of hanging around the periphery. They weren't in line, but they were standing there and they're watching us. And he said, that's, that's just what I'm talking about right there. Uh, they shouldn't have to buy the book. I can tell they're waiting around to work done. He said, go up and get them to come through the line. So he did. And Rob, the the man never said anything, but his wife said he was digging his own grave the day before you dropped the bomb. So this man could appreciate Paul Tibbetts more than anybody else ever, but it was very moving and something that I will never forget. And if people want to argue and you know, war is war. And I'm going to tell you, Major, it's, it, it's tough. But I don't think that Paul Tibbetts ever had any doubt in his mind that he did his duty. I was clearly convinced in my own mind, and I had people telling me how much property and lives that bomb would take when it exploded, because it was non-discriminatory. It took yes. everything. I made up my mind then that the morality of dropping that bomb was not my business. 
I was instructed to perform a military mission to drop the bomb, and that mm -hmm. was the thing that I was going to do to the best of my ability. Morality, there is no such thing in warfare. I don't care what whether you're dropping atom bombs or whether you're dropping uh, 100 pound bombs, there's or you're shooting a rifle. Mm -hmm. There, you got to leave the moral issue sure. out of it. He told me a story about security for the Manhattan Project, and. Uh, he said they, you know, of course, uh, spies were constantly trying to penetrate. And he said they did have a spy in Chicago, and uh, they were able to prove it. And I said, well, I don't remember ever reading anything about that. He said, no one knows about it. it, it that project was so sensitive, you couldn't arrest somebody for penetrating a project that officially doesn't exist. I said, what happened? He said he was told the to, be on the corner of Dearborn and Jackson at five o'clock and he was shot in the head. Mm. He said the Chicago police department probably still has that as an open unsolved murder, mm. but it was war. It was war and he was the enemy. Wow. And I feel like that's what he, that's what he did in his entire career. Of course, he went on to become a general and had a very distinguished career in the establishment of the Air Force. And of course, his, um, his uh, grandson is is a general now. Yes, and it's, and it's been to Quincy. Yes, and, been, and received very well. I always uh, think of the Tibbets, and they just come back home when that's the case, even him. Always be home, and again, if you think, you know, we've had a lot of great people come from our community that we can take pride in. And we've had others that weren't so great, but also had huge impact on world events. You know, James O. Ray, for instance. But I don't think there's anyone in the category of General Paul Tibbetts. And uh, I think it's wonderful that we were able to celebrate a new millennium uh, with our foremost favorite son. That's a really cool story. Let's let's move along to some other individuals that you've run in, into over time. And since the Supreme Court is in the news today. You met a couple of Supreme Court justices, Antonin Scalia and Clarence Thomas. Will you start with Scalia and then tell us about how you met Clarence Thomas? This is a story that not too many people could tell uh, because at the time we were pretty much sworn to secrecy. But uh, and I'm sure the majority of our listeners would have no idea that Antonin Scalia was in Quincy, but he was. I didn't believe it at first myself. I, uh, Dr. David Wright, who, uh, in addition to his uh, professional uh, dentistry, he is a licensed federal firearms dealer and has uh, obtained uh, a lot of different things for the Quincy Police Department that we've needed over the years. And he came in to see me one time at City Hall, and I said, what's up, Doc? He said, well, I, uh, I need to use the police range. You might recall, Rob, on South 12th Street, for many years, we had a police firing range out there. Uh, it's actually built out over the underground warehouse. And eventually, I, I think we lost the lease. Uh, in recent years, our officers are getting trained and certified at Passive Park down in Barrie. But in those days, we had a nice police range out there. And there was a nice uh, hall there that was used by the Police Benevolent Protective Association. And he said he wanted to be able to go out there. And I said, well, what's up? He said, well, I've got a Supreme Court justice. And Dr. Wright has a collection of interesting old armaments. He's got a Tommy gun. He's got an M60, uh, all sorts of weaponry. And he wanted to have his friend shoot it. And I said, do you have a Supreme Court justice? And I thought he meant an Illinois Supreme Court justice. So I don't really know many of them, but I've you know, met him. And I said, well, who, who is it? He said, Scalia. And I know I must have looked condescending or patronizing. And I said, Doctor, do you really think Antonio Scalia is coming to Quincy? And he said, Mayor, he's at my house right now. <laughs> so I think that was maybe a Wednesday. I, and he explained to me that they had met on a hunting trip in Louisiana, and he had invited the justice to come up and, and hunt along the Mississippi up here in uh, Adams County. And so... <laughs> I said, well, of course, I will set it up, but I would like to go, and I'd like to take my friend Brent Fisher, our sheriff. Uh, and so the 
we showed up out there Friday morning, and uh, I am not a gun enthusiast. I don't know anything about them. And they proposed a contest. You know, they've got the targets, the kind of the male figure with the uh, bullseye and so forth. And uh, Dr. Wright and Justice Scalia uh, encouraged Brent Fisher and I to get into this contest with them. Now, Brent, of course, can can handle it, but I couldn't. But we had our range officer there, uh, Officer Dwayne Long, now retired from the police department. And I said, we pick out the lightest gun because it'll probably knock me on my rear end with the kickback and, uh, you know, just just set it up for me and and hand it to me so I don't shoot my toes off or anything. So he had, it wasn't an Uzi, but it was like a small Uzi similar to that. We each had 30 rounds and this one didn't uh, have much of a recoil to it. So we all fired away. And when we retrieved the targets, I can say that my guy was probably a little bit shook up maybe i don't think i hit you just concerned him you, you just you put some concern <laughs> yeah into it, it was some cause for concern <laughs> it actually you know you would not be surprised major but it was a pattern of going up that is not a surprise well 30 rounds go off you know as soon as i touch the trigger and unconsciously i guess i you know i moved the barrel upwards uh Scalia, i can report you know pretty much nailed him in the chest cold hearted. <laughs> yeah. It was well this is it was fair in mind this is nineteen ninety eight, two years before he stole the election from Al Gore and, you know, global warming, uh Iraq war Gulf War, whatever, you know, I could I could say all of that. I don't want to put all of that on just oh yeah. But uh at the time, yeah, uh who could predict that uh Bush versus Gore would uh, decide the outcome of a, of a presidential election. Get over it. It's so old by now. The principal uh, issue in the case, whether the scheme that the Florida Supreme Court had put together violated the federal constitution, that wasn't even close. The vote was seven to two. It was Al Gore who made it a judicial question. It was he who brought it into the Florida courts. We didn't go looking for trouble. It was he who, who who said, I want this to be decided by the courts. What are we supposed to say? Oh, not important enough. We went in and we had lunch together. They brought in some fried chicken and iced tea and potato salad. And I got to sit next to Justice Scalia and we got to talking. And, you know, I'm a Catholic. He's a Catholic. I went to Georgetown University. So did he. I'm from a big family. He, I think, also family of seven kids. And we hit it off pretty well, I have to say. And now, in, over all these years, I've read how uh, he and uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg were such close friends and went to the opera and their families visited back and forth. So I can see that uh, you can have some really significant ideological differences and, and still get along with people. He's a very nice man and, and very charming. And, of course, he was brilliant. I just didn't agree with uh his legal philosophy. What he decided, yeah. Yeah, but no, quite a guy. And yes, he was in Quincy, and uh, nobody knew it. That was one. You can imagine, Rob, that, you know, back, this is 1998, so whoever it would be, Time Magazine, USA Today, whatever, uh, would love to have a picture of a Supreme Court justice firing away with an automatic weapon uh, <laughs> with all the gun control to face. So, uh, we were all, he had, he had one person with him who was a uh, U.S. Marshal. He had a U.S. Marshal, he had a son-in-law who lived up around Naperville, as I recall. And that was it. And I really think if Peter walked in to a convenience store, of course, they may have recognized the name on a credit card or something, but I think to look at the guy, uh, at least back then, I don't think anybody would have uh, recognized him. Of course, his closest uh, compatriot on the court was Clarence Thomas. And Clarence Thomas also came to Quincy. Actually, um, it's over College, but Smith and I here, and I was able to have dinner with him over at Culver Stockton. Clarence Thomas' best friend is a guy named Larry Thompson. Larry Thompson, born and raised in Hannibal, Missouri. 
graduated from Culver Stockton College. This is back in the 60s when, as an African American pursuing a legal career, it required breaking through some, some barriers. And Larry uh, had a tremendous legal career, including being Associate Attorney General of the United States under John Ashcroft, the number two position in the Justice Department, and went through all the post-9-11 and, and terrorism uh, fight and all of that. He also then went on to become General Counsel for PepsiCo, which is a huge corporation, not only Pepsi, but um, Frito-Lay, you know, I think they have Taco Bell and KFC and all sorts of things. Uh, and uh, he's now retired, but he takes on these assignments like the uh, Volkswagen case with the uh, emission standards. So quite a guy. His best friend is Clarence Thomas. This is his alma mater. So he says, could you come to Culver Stockton and speak to the students? And he did. And he gave a great speech. And before the speech, we had this dinner. I'm on the board of trustees over there, and we hosted him, and I was fortunate enough to get seated by him. And we had a heck of a nice dinner, Rob. This guy, uh, you know, we started out talking about um, what he likes to do. I'm a golfer. I said, how about you? He said, no, no, no. I said, well, you like to play tennis? What do you do to relax? And he told me that he owns this huge recreational vehicle that, is actually the chassis of like a Greyhound bus, and that he and his wife travel the country and stay in RV parks. I had no idea. Since then, I think 60 Minutes and others have done stories on that. But you can imagine that, you know, you're at uh, Valley View Campground, and uh, this big old RV pulls in, and here's uh, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Tom. But that's what he likes to do. I knew that he was from Pinpoint, Georgia, which is about halfway between uh, Savannah and Brunswick, Georgia. And I'm pretty familiar with that part of Georgia. And we started talking about that. And I told him he went to Mercer Law School in Macon. And he said he almost went there. Uh, and I knew that he had spent a year in a Catholic seminary. Wow. So I, I didn't know that. Him, yeah. And I asked him, I said, no. Judge, you're probably familiar with Father Tolton, aren't you? You know, an African-American that wants to be a Catholic priest, I would think, but he's never heard of it. So, you know, what ensued then, Rob, you can imagine, I unloaded the entire uh, history from, from Rawls County to Quincy to Chicago to Rome with uh, Father Tolton, and he was very interested. So uh, the next day, I sent him... Uh, Rather, I wouldn't say it's just a pamphlet. It's like a small biography of Father Tolton that Father uh, Roy Bauer of St. Peter's had written. And I've given a lot of those away over the years. And I sent that off to him in Washington and got the nicest personal letter back uh, talking about our enjoyable dinner and how much uh, he enjoyed reading about Father Tolton. So, uh, yeah, I don't think most people have any idea that Clarence Thomas and Anthony Scalia have have been to Quincy, but they have. And uh, who knows? Uh, there may be others out there that I'm not aware of, but those are two that I got to have a close-up encounter with. Well, you'd mentioned another, kind of stay in politics a little bit, that you made a you met a famous political couple, David Eisenhower and Julie Nixon Eisenhower. And they were very interesting. The Quincy YWCA had uh, invited them to give a presentation in the evening. And this is when the YWCA was on uh, Jersey Street between 4th and 5th on the north side of Jersey in a beautiful old home next to the Dr. Eels house. That was the Morgan Morgan Wells house. Was it? Yep. Yeah, a great house. Uh, but in any event, uh, I met them there at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And they took a little tour of the house. You might recall there was a gymnasium built on the back. And, and we saw the programs that were taking place at the Y. And then we just sat down in this nice sort of parlor and were served tea. And I got to just visit with them. And uh, two impressions. One is 
Julie Nixon Eisenhower. I'm not sure I've ever met anyone more poised in my life. She knew exactly, you know, where to stand, where to sit, who to thank, gracious, perfect manners. Um, and I, you know, an attractive woman, but to look at her, Rob, <laughs> you could not escape. Her father, <laughs> the image she of her was father, at Richard Nixon, <laughs> and I mean that's just uh, she had you know I think her sister Patricia favored her mother, but uh, and I, again it's not in a unattractive way, but she was clearly a Nixon, and I got to thinking you know here's this woman who has been through what five national presidential campaigns intimately. I mean. You know, her father ran for vice president in 52 and 56 and ran for president in 60 and 68 and 72. He's always been in the spotlight. And the Watergate and the Watergate oh, and the resignation. Right. And so, the, you know, when I'm meeting her, she, this is uh, 20 years later in the 90s. Uh, but she was extremely impressive. And not that David wasn't, but David is shy reserved, kind of bookish, I'd say. Uh, and, of course, you know, for our listeners, Camp David, that's David Eisenhower. I right. uh, the name for his grandson. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously a real smart guy. And the thing that we hit it off on, back uh, in the mid-'90s, Quincy Gems baseball was just uh, the hottest thing around. Uh, we were packing the ballpark every night we were written up USA Today and other periodicals, you know, baseball the way it ought to be. Here's these college kids playing with wooden bats and staying in people's homes and the whole town's coming out and so forth. And he asked me about since baseball didn't take much to get me going on that and how we did it. But he was very interested in that. And knew about Quincy in terms of baseball history. Uh, brought up the old three I league which I don't know too much about that was uh, Iowa, Indiana, and Illinois, and Quincy was a major team there. And that you know there were a lot of great players uh, that came through here, uh, including Hank Bauer, who started in Quincy in 1946. Hank Bauer had just gotten out of the Marines. He was a hero in the South Pacific in World War II. Great, big, strong guy. Got signed by the New York Yankees, who's one of their farm teams. You know, in those days, the minor league system was really extensive. But they assigned him to Quincy. And uh, Tom Oakley told me that he that Hank Bauer played every position that summer, dominated the league. And so, of course, he didn't last beyond that one summer. And they moved him to Kansas City, which was their AAA, and then on to the Yankees, where uh, he went on to... I think he won four World Series rings with the Yankees, and then he won one with Baltimore Orioles when he managed them. But quite a guy. So in 1946, he's staying at the Elkton Hotel, and he's uh, walking up 4th Street, and they're right there on the uh, east side of 4th was the Chicago Motor Club, and there's this pretty girl that works in the window there that he can see, and one day he works up his courage, stops in, and he says, Hey, I'm one of the ball players. Uh, I got a couple tickets here if you'd like to come out and watch us play. Well, they had a summer romance, but Hank moved on to the Yankees and, you know, Mickey Mantle and uh, Yogi Bear and all those wild times of the Yankees and Whitey Ford and all that and went, went on to history. But uh, around, I think, the early 90s, Hank, who uh, was a widower, made contact with that young woman that he'd met back in 1946, who was a widow. They both lost their spouses. And he had retired back to Kansas City. And that sparked a romance that was rekindled. And it was a wonderful, beautiful thing. And he would come to Quincy about every other weekend, and then she would go to Kansas City. So people may have seen a guy around Quincy. Uh, he was uh, a frequent visitor. And was very good about going out to the Illinois Veterans Home and signing for all the veterans and fellow veterans out there. And we had a night at the ballpark for him out with the gyms. And 
he was so gracious and uh, really a wonderful person. But uh, almost had as Quincy as as an adopted home over here and got to know a whole bunch of people. I I know if there's anybody listening here that uh, from the old Elks Club, uh, he'd be down there. Uh, yeah, like I say, about every other weekend. So, uh, and while we're talking about baseball, Rob. Can I bring up a familiar Quincy name of El Pappy? Absolutely. So El and Mel, twin brothers, both tremendous athletes. El went on to the Cubs, and he participated in what they called the College of Coaches, where Mr. Wrigley, uh, he had various coaches serve as managers on a rotating basis. And what I wanted to mention about him is how well-known he was outside of Quincy. You know, we've had some great baseball players, Jim Finnegan, Right. who made the all-star team for Kansas City Athletics. Uh, well, Chris Ostermuller, right. who uh, is depicted in that Jackie Robinson movie in a very unfavorable light as being one of the prejudiced ball players who uh, went out of their way to give Robinson a hard time. But, you know, when I was growing up, Chris Ostermuller, was, you always heard that name as one of the great athletes at Quincy. Uh, same way with Jim Finnegan, who was a high school athlete with my dad and my uncle, and uh, he was always our favorite player when I got to high school. His wife was my Spanish teacher. She was my Spanish teacher, too. <laughs> right. Peggy Finnegan, great lady. But anyway, with El Pappy, first time I ever met Lou Brock, and I got to meet him a couple of times, he said, you're from Quincy? How's El Pappy? And I said, you know, El? he said, El Pappy was my manager. He's the first manager to ever send me out to start a big league game. And I thought, wow, well, I'll tell L. And uh, Ernie Banks. We brought Ernie Banks here for the uh, Lung Association. And in setting that up, he said, Quincy, L. Taffy still around. You know, they, they played together. Uh, and Jeffy White, our Illinois Secretary of State, who I've gotten to know very well over the years, a great man. Uh, but when I first met him, first question was, how's L. Taffy? Because uh, Jesse White uh, was managed by El Taffy at the Cubs AAA farm team in Salt Lake City, Utah. So, uh, you know, there's there's always all these Quincy connections. And let me just close with this, Rob. Uh, I had mentioned to you earlier about our airport. Quincy Regional Airport uh, is situated in a good spot for cross-country air traffic to set down and refuel. And over the years, we've had a lot of that where uh, folks going, say, from L.A. to New York, uh, it's better to set down clear of the Chicago air traffic or St. Louis. Quincy has restaurants, got a fixed base operation, and so forth. Well, we have a few rather frequent travelers. Uh, Back when I was mayor, Steven Spielberg and Kate Capshaw would be in Quincy frequently. I think just about every time they went from coast to coast, they stopped in Quincy because Kate uh, had an elderly relative at Good Samaritan Home. So they would come into Quincy uh, and visit. They were close friends with Gene and Peg Simon uh, from Chattanooga School and frequent Quincy visitors. Another guy that you may have seen in a spotlight and thought, that can't be John Travolta. Uh, Ian Isaacson from Quincy uh, became personal trainer to John Travolta and I think uh, other Hollywood stars, but very close with John Travolta. And one day I ran into Dan's mother out at the store and she, I said, how's Dan? She said, oh, let me show you these pictures. And she had these pictures. She pulled. This wasn't the days that you pull out your phone, Rob. These were actual, you know, out of her first <laughs> photos. And I said, oh, there you are with John Travolta. That's great. Did you have a chance to go out and visit Dan in Hollywood? She said, oh, no. That picture was taken in my living room here in Quincy. And I said, really? And she said, well, you know, John Travolta likes to fly. And when he's flying across the country, he'll refuel in Quincy, get a car, and drive in and come to my house. So astounding. But uh, John Travolta, like I say, if you're, that's 36 in Broadway, and you look over and you think, yeah, it wouldn't be John Travolta driving that round. It just could be. <laughs> it might be. Can I ask you about one other individual? Yeah, absolutely. I know, and I remember this from, a, you know, I grew up in the 70s. That's when I was a child. 
And so I remember Captain Kangaroo, and I knew that you met oh, uh, Captain Kangaroo. Captain Kangaroo. Such a, first of all, I watched Captain Kangaroo as a kid. Uh, my mom was a big believer in the captain. In fact, I had not signed something from my mom. But uh, you remember we used to have the Quincy Conference here uh, for teachers, brought in thousands of teachers. And they were Bob Keeson, Captain Kangaroo, following his career in children's television, became a leading national expert on pediatric health care. So this guy really cared about kids. And the Quincy Conference, our teachers wanted to have him do a presentation. Well, they had a $5,000 budget. It was $10,000 uh, to bring the captain in. And they came to see me at City Hall. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll raise that other five if he could also do a presentation for the community. So he was going to do one out at the Quincy Conference, which I think was the luncheon. And then that evening, we had him at the Civic Center. And he, he great, gave a great talk. So I said, well, there's only one other condition. I want to be able to pick him up to the airport. <laughs> I want some face time with the staff. And Dr. David Lohmeyer, who is no longer in Quincy, but a great man, great pediatrician, who was on the cutting edge and knew all about Bob Keeson's work, he wanted to go along. And I said, absolutely, back you and I. The captain was not in to get in the small aircraft. Mm. So uh, his plan was to fly into St. Louis. But we get down there and uh, we're waiting. I think and this was... Uh, you know, you had a little better access, as I recall, at the airport. Uh, you know, it was all prior to 9-11. And uh, we're waiting for to uh, see the plane pull up and then uh, the passengers disembark. And I said, uh, hey, I've got to use the restroom. And I think the doc would get a magazine. But the long story short was we missed the captain. We lost him. <laughs> and I'm thinking, how could you lose the captain in the airport? You know, this guy, he's got, you still had that haircut. Right. You can't miss it. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I think he really kind of had on a big jacket with large pockets, a la Captain Kenny Reed. So anyway, <laughs> uh, we go, we, we can't find him. And they've, they, they, you know, I asked the lady there, oh, no, they're all disembarked. They're gone. So we went out and we headed to, uh, baggage claim and there he was and the guy just had a small carry-on but he liked to check through he, he was a real particular traveler we had some things to give him and he just says you know i just travel so light i if you don't mind and he'd give you the card you, you ship him he lived in uh vermont hmm. but we get him we, we find him we get him in the car and rob for the first way back save from Lambert Field to uh, Bowling Green. We're all busy. We're talking pediatric health care here. What we need to be doing with prevention, early childhood intervention, that sort of thing. But I have to admit, after about an hour of that, I just had to break down and ask him about Mr. Green Jeans. I was going to say, did you ask him about Mr. Green Jeans? <laughs> yes. Who... Uh, you know, was a musical performer way back in the, uh, I forget if he played for Glenn Miller or whatever. I can't remember his name. Bumpy was his first name. But anyway, uh, we had a great time. And in the course of all that, and he asked about Quincy, you know, for many people in the 90s at least, the flood of 93 was a major point of reference for Quincy, Illinois. That's what they knew about Quincy. They saw that battle depicted on the news of, you know, the, friends and neighbors making sandbags and trying to keep their bridge open and help their friends and neighbors along the river. So we got to talking about the flood and about the loss of the levee, July 16th, 1993, with James Scott from Sabotage. And I told him that I was familiar through a, a close associate in the probation department that told me that James Scott and his brother, who were well-known arsonists in Quincy. They had burned down Webster School, used to stand at 12th in Maine. That's an exercise area for junior high now. Uh, they burned that school down. I think one of them was 12 and one of them was 10. And you know, he had just been released from prison and a uh, dangerous person that should never be allowed out ever again. But in any event, uh, I told you, Bob Keish and Captain Kangaroo that this person that did this and caused all these hundreds of millions of dollars in destruction was the victim of child abuse as, as a very young child. 
and then it come out in the free sentence investigation and so forth. So that night when he made his speech to the community, he used that as an example of why when you invest in early childhood, health care, prevention, uh, education, all of those things, not only is it the right thing to do, it's a smart thing to do. And it's a smart thing to do financially. And he used that as an example. If someone could have intervened way back in Jim Scott's childhood, maybe he wouldn't have wrought hundreds of millions of dollars in damage and you know, potential loss of life. We're very fortunate and blessed that we didn't have any loss of life, but it certainly we had some very close calls. So he used that in speech. And then after the speech, people wanted to come up and meet Captain Ken Group. So there's a long receiving line and, you know, everybody's talking about the show and how they loved it and so forth. And there was this fella. He kind of waited to the end and he came in and he said, I taught Jim Scott first grade at Irving School and I always suspected that there was something going on. And the guy was really upset and emotional. He said, you know, you have to understand, we did not have any kind of reporting system back then. There was no hotline. We didn't know what to do. We didn't know what we could do or should do. And Bob Keeshan was extremely sympathetic and empathetic and told the guy not to take it on himself. It's not his fault. He totally understands and he did what he could and so forth. But uh, that's the thing I would take away from Captain Kangaroo's visit, a uh, great man, very empathetic, and uh, and certainly I think he did a lot of good on a one-day visit to, to Quincy. Well, that's amazing. And thanks, Chuck. I really appreciate it. A lot of interesting stories and people who pass through town. Well, thank you. I have uh, really been privileged to have represented our city in, in meeting people here and on various travels on behalf of our community. Uh, and we got one coming up, Rob, this is a tease with uh, Gordon B. Hinckley, the president of the Church of Latter-day Saints, who was quite a guy, 94 years old when he came to Quincy, and uh, uh, extremely impressive. So we'll leave that for the next podcast. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, Rob. I'd like to thank former Mayor Chuck Schultz for taking us back down memory lane once again with stories about some of the people that passed through town that he had the opportunity to meet. And I don't blame you, Chuck. I would have asked Captain Kangaroo about Mr. Green Jeans, too. And I'd like to encourage all the listeners to become members of the Historical Society of Quincy and Adams County. Just go to hsqac.org for more information. There's a new, easier way to become a member online. Just go to hsqac.org and check it out. Remember to subscribe to the podcast and leave a review or like our Facebook page and leave a comment. There are many more Tales from the Gym City coming soon. Subscribing to the podcast is the way to get Chuck's stories and tales immediately when they're released. And join us again next time when we talk, think, and drink on History of Go-Go. Good morning. Good times as you dream.